Good morning. My name is Corey Arnold, and I am the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. Thank you so much for joining us in worship this morning. Our goal is simple. It is to worship our great God. Even though we can't be in the same physical space, we can still worship as his children through his spirit. So let's worship together. I have a few announcements to share with you. Please check out our website, QuakertownBFC.org, for the most up-to-date information. Also, Pastor Ron and Pastor Tim will continue to post fireside chats on Tuesdays and Fridays, as well as a virtual prayer meeting for Wednesday evenings. If you have a smartphone, you can download church.app and enter our church's name to receive notifications on your phone. Again, that is church.app. As a staff, we are still able to meet regularly, and we would love to hear from you. If you'd have a question, you could please contact us or your elder shepherd. After the call to worship this morning, we encourage you to briefly pause this recording as we have two hymns for you to sing. How Great Thou Art, and My Jesus, I Love Thee. If you're on our email list, you should have received links to YouTube videos and the sheet music that can go along with these songs. At the end of the benediction, there are three additional songs for you to sing to end this time of worship. This is a reminder to silence any electronic devices. For those of you who aren't used to coming to our church on Sunday morning, that's how I typically end my time of announcement. So I say that slightly jokingly. However, we want to encourage you to remove as many distractions as possible so we can worship our great God together. Good morning. I'm Pastor Tim, the assistant pastor here at Grace Bible Fellowship. This morning I'll be reading our call to worship and praying our invocation. We're going to be reading this morning from Psalm 18. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we are thankful, thankful that you are this God we have read about, the God who is strength unmeasured, the God who is our rock and our fortress and our deliverer. We thank you that we can come to you in times of distress, that you are there to comfort, that you are an ever-present refuge, an ever-present help in times of need. This is the God that we come to worship, and we pray that you would be pleased with our worship this morning. And we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from John chapter 11. I invite you to turn there. This passage is what is immediately preceding to what the sermon will be on this morning. John chapter 11, we'll be reading verses 17 through 44. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, 
supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are again thankful that we can be here this morning. Though we are not together in person, we are together by your spirit, and we thank you that we can hear from your word. We thank you that that your word is perfect and that it reveals to us exactly your will. Lord, we are so grateful for what you have done for us. We are so thankful that you have sent your son into the world, that he is the resurrection and the life, that all who believe in him will have life eternal. Father, this morning... Many of us come and we are troubled. Our hearts are restless. Our minds are filled with with the anxieties of this world. We see sickness. We see fear. We see those around us scared. We don't know exactly how to help those. But Lord, we, we know that you have promised to be our refuge and that you have promised to bring life We pray that you would help us as your people to to display the light of life that you have given to us. We pray that we would be ready to answer those around us. What is the hope that is within us? That the hope is Jesus Christ who lives in us. Lord, we we come to you in these difficult times and, and we think about people, not just ourselves, not just our own church, We think about people in our country and around the world. Lord, we pray that you would bring healing. We pray that you you would bring a resolution to this illness. That it would come quickly. That you would use the the governments, the physicians, those that that are gifted to understand. We pray that you would use them and their abilities to bring a swift end to this pandemic. Lord, we... We pray in the midst of it, though, that you would give us comfort. You would give us comfort to know that that you are good, that you still love us. Lord, we pray that you would give us the comfort to know that we do not need to fear, not because this illness is not real, not because there are not potentially serious consequences, but Lord, you give us Comfort knowing that we have a hope in a future, a future that is with you where there is no more illness, where there is no more disease, where there is no more crying. Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the life that he has brought, not just in this world, but in the one to come. Lord, we pray all these things in his name. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. What a great privilege it is to open God's holy, inerrant, 
infallible and life-giving word. Our sermon for this morning is called An Act of Extravagant Love, and I invite you in advance to open your Bibles and to be reading along as we study it together. We're going to be in John chapter 12. Our text for this morning is John 12, 1 through 8. When it's time to go to the eye doctor, the optometrist, you know that at some point they're going to sit you down in front of an eye chart. Technically, it is officially a Snellen eye chart, but you know what it looks like. The largest print is on the top row, and each row gets progressively smaller in type. You may be asked how far down the chart you can read, and then the optometrist is going to ask you to cover one eye and read with the other. And at that point, you really need to focus all your attention needs to be drawn to the Snell and I chart so you can see as clearly as possible so they can prescribe for you the proper lenses. Palm Sunday is just a week away. Easter will be upon us in just two weeks. The seven days between Jesus' triumphal entry and his rising from the tomb has been called the most momentous week in world history, and that is indeed true. This is where our focus needs to be. It's easy in the days in which we're living with often disturbing updates on the spread of the coronavirus coming on an almost daily basis to lose our focus, to turn inward and give way to worry and to fear. Let's be careful. But let us not panic. The greatest way that we do that is to put our focus where it needs to be, on the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Over the next several weeks, we're going to put our focus on Jesus by preparing for his death and his glorious resurrection. Eyes off self, eyes on Jesus. We're going to do this by honing in on the account of the momentous events of this final week that John the Apostle has recorded for us. So as we turn to the 12th chapter of John's Gospel, we are right at the edge of a crossroads. John breaks his gospel into two halves, or two books. Chapters 1 through 12 can rightly be called the book of the signs, because John focuses primarily on our Lord's miracles with the idea that they're signs. They, they point to something. They point to who Jesus is. He is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. All these signs point us to Jesus, to his person, and to his great work. But then, starting in John 13, we have John's second book, which is sometimes called the book of his passion. John devotes nine chapters, about 40 to 45 percent of his gospel, to a single week in the life of our Lord. Like the other gospel writers, John amplifies the week from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday because it's that important. It's the week when Jesus finishes his great work of redemption, of salvation, of completing the task that his father gave him to do. And so now let's take our eyes off ourselves and put them on Jesus. Because as we do, our trials and our challenges will become smaller as we magnify him. It's like the old gospel song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full on his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. More than ever, we need to turn our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. For as we do, we will worship him. We will magnify his name. And we will overflow with gratitude for all he has done for us. So let's read the text together. Follow along as I read John 12, 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, 
said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. Thus ends the reading of God's life-giving word. Five characters are part of this tender scene in Bethany, a village that's just two miles from Jerusalem. There's Jesus, who is the recipient of an act of great affection. There are the sisters, Mary and Martha, and their brother, brother Lazarus. And there's Judas Iscariot, who is identified here by two markers, that he is one of Jesus' disciples, and that he is about to betray the Lord he has been following as a disciple, as an apprentice. Now, there may be others here. It's possible that all the disciples were present, as well as others who were close to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, but they're not mentioned in John's account. I think it's John's intention to make this an intimate scene. Just a few people, all reclining at low table, leaning up against the table with their feet extended outward. Now, we've just heard, as Pastor Tim read, the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. That's the reason for this dinner, undoubtedly, or at least part of the reason. John tells us as much in verse 1 when he identifies Lazarus. He says there in Bethany where Lazarus was, and Lazarus is identified as the one whom Jesus had raised from the dead. John wants us to know, first of all, that Lazarus is very much alive. Not only had Jesus raised him, but John uses a tense that literally indicates where Lazarus presently was. He is alive. Jesus spoke, and Lazarus came out of the tomb, and now here he is reclining at table at the dinner given in honor of the one who had resurrected him. But John has also told us that the resurrection of Lazarus had solidified the verdict of the religious establishment that it was time for Jesus to die. Many who were there the day Lazarus came out of the tomb had seen it. And John tells us they had believed. And at that point, the religious leaders all gathered together and they essentially said, what are we going to do about Jesus? They had long opposed him, but now they stepped up their plans to eliminate him. For after all, it's hard to deny the power and the claims to deity of Jesus when you've got Lazarus as exhibit A. Lazarus, the dead man, turned alive. He's right there. And this is a problem especially for the high priest that year, Caiaphas, for Caiaphas was a Sadducee. And the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection in any form. And yet, how do you explain away a man who had, by all accounts, been dead for four days and now was very much alive? And so that puts the capper on the leader's plan to eliminate Jesus. And John has already told us this. He has said that Caiaphas is of the mindset shared by most of his leaders that if Jesus continues to grow in popularity, the Romans will see him as a rival king and they will crush not only Jesus, but everything that is of importance to the Jewish people. So Caiaphas says, John chapter 11, verse 50, it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Well, Caiaphas was, of course, saying far more than he knew. For Jesus, the one man, would indeed die for the many, for the salvation of many, for the forgiveness of sins for all who would trust in him. For Jesus, at the cross, will take their sins upon himself and will pay the price that they owed. All of that is in the offing. And now it's just before Palm Sunday. One of the other gospel writers has said that Jesus, at this point, has set his face toward Jerusalem. His eyes are on the cross. But before he mounts a donkey and rides into Jerusalem, with people waving their palm branches, we have this scene that is now before us. It's an act of courage for Mary and her siblings to honor Jesus this way knowing that there's a plot against him. 
you can look to verses 9 through 11 in this chapter, the passage that right directly follows the verses we're studying, and we can see that the chief priests are planning not just the, to kill Jesus, but also to put Lazarus to death. So exhibit A, in support of Jesus as the Messiah, will just go away. So knowing this, what Mary and Martha and Lazarus do for our Lord is a courageous event. I told, already told you that there are five characters in this scene, and three of the five have their moments. First, we see Mary's act of extravagant love. And then Judas steps in with his reaction of false piety. And then finally, John presents Jesus' response that draws our attention, our focus, to what is yet to come. We begin with Mary's act of extravagant love, which we see in verses 1 through 3. See the posture of the participants at the dinner. Lazarus is reclining at table, enjoying the meal. Martha is cooking and serving. That is a very Martha thing to do. And then there's Mary. Perhaps at this point you remember another scene featuring Mary and Martha. Luke gives us an account in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, of, of Martha complaining as she was serving on another occasion that Mary wasn't doing anything. Where's Mary on that day? What's she up to? Well, where Mary is, is the same place where she's at now. She's at Jesus' feet. You know, almost every time that Mary is mentioned in the Gospels, she is in the same place. She is at the feet of Jesus. And what's she doing there? She's learning from him. She's loving him. She's in a posture of worship and adoration. That's where we're all to be, aren't we? Mary's top priority, and it's presented again and again in the gospel accounts, is her Lord Jesus. Now what we see here from Mary is not a spur of the moment thing. This is not something that she just decided at that very time. This is well thought out. And it's more than just, I think, an act of gratitude for what Jesus has done in resurrecting her brother. No, Mary does what she does because she loves her Lord. And she has loved Jesus far longer than just what we see in, in John chapter 11. He is her focus. He is what she sees more than anything or anyone else. And there's something else here. And we see it subtly, but it's here, that Mary has a sense that Jesus' time with her is drawing to a close. Jesus even says as much. And indeed, it seems like Mary is the only person around Jesus who has a proper awareness that the Lord is about to die. Even though Jesus has been telling his disciples more than once that he is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies and killed at the hands of the authorities and then he will be raised on the third day. But they don't get it. They won't get it until after his resurrection. But Mary does. So now, loving him and knowing that he is about to depart, Mary does what she does as a deliberate act. Verse 3 says that she took a pound, literally about 11 and a half ounces of nard or spike nard. It's an oil extracted from a plant that grows primarily in the region of the Himalayas. You get the idea that we're here in the, in the ancient east and the Himalayas are far away, so it's not easily obtainable. Parallel accounts in Matthew 26 and Mark 14 tell us that she took an alabaster flask and she broke it, and then she poured out the oil. She was not sparing. She didn't save any of it. Jesus received it all. And Judas' response here tells us how valuable it was. He says it could have been sold for 300 denarii. Denarius was the average daily wage of a day worker, a common man. So 300 denarii would have represented a whole year's wages. So put this in perspective. I did some searching. I understand I'm not a man. I do not wear perfume, but I understand that Chanel Number no. 5 is still expensive. I saw online you can purchase it for $340 for a fluid ounce. That's expensive. But what Mary did cost the modern-day equivalent 
of thousands and thousands of dollars. So imagine Mary taking $30,000 worth of perfume. That gives us a sense of the value of what she did. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were wealthy, although it's certainly possible that they were. More than likely, though, Mary would have been saving this for one of just two things, her wedding day or her own death. This could have been a family heirloom that was being saved to be part of Mary's dowry on the day she was married. Or else it could have been saved like the valuable mixture of myrrh and aloes that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus set aside to prepare Jesus' body for burial once he was taken down from the cross. Mary broke the vial and the sweet fragrance of the nard filled the home because of what she did with it. For she anointed Jesus' feet with the whole vial. And this too must not be overlooked. We read elsewhere in the Gospels how the role of washing a person's feet was reserved for the lowest slave and, and that even many slaves would claim one of their few rights and would refuse to engage in the lowliness of foot washing. But Mary did this willingly and deliberately. And then she did something else. She let down her hair. She wiped his feet with her hair. This simply was not done. A woman letting her hair down was a breach of etiquette of the worst kind. It was a scandalous act. Rick Phillips says that if a married woman let down her hair in public, that was cause for divorce. And if a single woman did so, it was thought she's being lewd and lascivious. And she could have been stoned for doing so. Normally, a woman would let, only let down her hair in private and only in the most intimate of situations. But this is what Mary did. Why? Because she wanted Jesus to know that he was her all, that she was totally surrendered to him, not in an impure way. There's not a hint of that, but as an act of adoration. This is an act of worship, and it's costly. For Mary had come to know who Jesus was. She might not have known at all, but it's apparent from the gospel accounts that Mary knew that Jesus was the Messiah. She even said so in John 11 while Lazarus is still dormant in the tomb. She says to Jesus in John 11 verse 27, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. And when Lazarus came forth, her belief in Jesus just grew stronger. Think, by doing what she did, Mary is giving up much of her future plans. If this is part of her dowry, Mary is saying, Jesus, you are worth far more to me than even my own future. And she gave it all. She held nothing back. We can learn much about worship from this this kind of worship comes from a love for Jesus, and it is the product of deliberate thought. Mary saw Jesus as more precious than anything, and in, de in devotion, she bows at his feet, and she gives him her best. This is what our worship is to be. We are to see Jesus as our treasure, as more valuable than anything else. You know, I say to my own shame that I have often offered cheap worship by coming before my Lord, unprepared, with other things occupying the center stage of my mind. And Mary shows me this is not to be. Indeed, indeed Jesus deserves my extravagant worship. You know, John's account doesn't include a, a particular response from Jesus, but Mark has a parallel account, what I, what I believe is an account of the same event, and in it Jesus declares wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the world, in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And on this day in March 2020, we're telling her tale of extravagant worship. In Matthew's account, Matthew 26.10, Jesus declares simply, she has done a beautiful thing. So here we see worship that is not disconnected from the mind. She worships Jesus based on what she knows, based on what she believes about him. But worship, as Mary offers it, is also worship of the heart. 
She is open before him. She gives all of herself to him, and she expresses her love for him. Next, in verses 4 through 6, we see Judas's reaction of false piety. While the aroma of Mary's sweet act of devotion is still spreading throughout the room, the reverie of the moment is broken by Judas. Here in John, Judas is the one who speaks, but what he says, Matthew tells us, was what the other disciples were also saying. They were indignant. Why this waste? Here in verse 5, John gives us Judas' reasoning. And on the surface, it has a ring of reasonability to it, a ring of piety. As he says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? That's a very logical thing if it's accompanied by a true heart. But then John provides a detail that the other gospel writers don't. That Judas, as a keeper of the money bag, wasn't concerned for the poor at all. But because he was a thief, so he preferred that the nard would have been sold and turned into coinage that he could have then pilfered from the money bag. Judas' response stands in direct contrast to Mary. And it's easy to draw a very simple conclusion. Mary good, Judas bad. Be like Mary, not like Judas. But there's something deeper here. Something much more subtle. And we need to consider it. For who was Judas? Well, John tells us in verse 4 that he was one of his Jesus' disciples. That means that Judas had walked with Jesus, had talked with Jesus, had learned from Jesus, even had been sent out by Jesus to do ministry. He had had the benefit of, of intimacy with the Savior. And yet, we read this right in our own narrative. Judas was preparing for betrayal. John writes in verse 4 that he was about to betray him. And perhaps this event was the last straw that put him over the edge and caused him to seek out the chief priest for the purpose of turning Jesus over. And we know that Judas will betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. That works out to about 120 denarii. So Judas betrays Jesus for less than half the worth of the oil that Mary poured out while she bowed at his feet. And yet he can say, even as Mary gives all of herself to the worship of her Lord, he can say, what a waste. Judas shows us that it's entirely possible to be close to Jesus, to be close to religious things, and yet not know him. He shows us it's impossible to know about the Lord Jesus, but not see the value of giving all to him. And I ask myself, do I do this? Do I sometimes fail to see the matchless value of the Lord Jesus? For here we see Judas and the other disciples as well, seemingly embarrassed by this outpouring of devotion. Judas says what they're all thinking. We're capable of the same response. Don't go overboard. Ally yourself with Jesus. Be part of a church, but just don't go crazy. And we can do this in many ways. What's your response on a Sunday morning, for instance, when you see someone is maybe sitting in the very same pew who is visibly engaged in worship, not, not making a show of themselves, but moved in gratitude and love and devotion because what they're singing or what they're hearing prayed or preached is just so wonderful to them that the tears just start falling. And if you're singing, you just can't go on because it's so difficult to, to sing and cry at the same time. You, you have to stop. How, how do you respond when you see someone like that? Do you distance yourself? Do you, do you think, that person's just kind of off. Just a little too weird for my liking. Do you respond by thinking that that is so over the top? I mean, I love Jesus, but I, I, I'm not going to be a, a fanatic. So, so see the contrast. Here's Judas who says, Mary, you've wasted all that money by loving Jesus like that. And then there's Mary who by her action declares, 
you know, nothing is more important to me than Jesus, than falling at his feet in love and worshiping him. Finally, in verses 7 and 8, we see Jesus' response. It is a response that draws our attention to what is to come. For he says, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always will have with you, but you do not always have me. Hear first what Jesus was not saying. He's definitely not saying that the poor are unimportant to him or, to, uh, or that they can be unimportant to us. If you draw that conclusion, you go against the whole teaching of Scripture and you go against the actions of Jesus himself. That is not what Jesus is saying here. What he is saying, though, corrects our understanding of priorities and values. What is the highest value? What is the most important thing that we can do with our lives as Christian believers? The highest thing is to fall at the feet of Jesus in worship, in love, in adoration, and in service, and in devotion. The sentence structure in these verses is, is difficult. But what Jesus is saying, I think, to Mary and about Mary by her actions is that she is, by the things she does and the things she says and by his definition of those things, is that she is um, kind of looking forward, pointing ahead to what he is about to do. She knows he is going away. She might not know exactly what is going to happen in the next week or even the full meaning of her own sacrificial act of extravagant love, but just a day before his triumphal entry and less than a week before he will die as our sin bearer on the cross, she is preparing his body for the day of burial. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying he's here for a short time. The emphasis in saying that is on the, the, the unsurpassing value of Jesus and of worshiping him. He welcomes her act as he welcomes our true, heartfelt, grateful worship. Our cares must not get in the way of that. Not even our current cares about the coronavirus. The worship of, of, of our Lord Jesus Christ is to be our highest focus. And we are to lavish our extravagant love upon him. Oh, I tell you this, my brothers and sisters, I, I so very much look forward to our being together. Whether it's a week from now, or a month from now, or even a season from now, I, I can't wait for us to together bow before him in worship. But until then, we still have the privilege of worship. And until then, let us focus. Let's take eyes off self off self, put them on Jesus. We who know the grace and mercy of God in Jesus Christ, let us focus on him as we look forward to his death, as we prepare for his glorious resurrection, as we anticipate his ascension into glory and his current position, which is at the right hand of the Father in a position of power. And so we can sing, along with one of the songs that is a supplement to the end of the service. Take my love, my Lord, I pour. At thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Ever only all for thee. There's nothing more important than our worship of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. May our focus be on him. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for providing your word. You reveal yourself through your word. You, you show us who Jesus is and what he has done. You show us what are truly important things to be doing, and that the highest value, what you have made us for, is to enjoy you and to worship and to glorify your name and to do this every day of our lives. Lord, we know that there are things happening in our world that can easily distract us. And we can focus all our attention on the news reports, most of which are bad news for the time being, but remind us that you are in control and you are both powerful and loving. And in your love, you sent your son. So help us to prepare for that Passion Week, 
Help us to set aside our time every day for worship and the study of your word. May we look eagerly, eagerly to you, to what you have done for sinners like us, and may we relish it and may we worship you with full and grateful hearts. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, brothers, hear the benediction. I found this week what is called the breastplate prayer of St. Patrick. May Christ be your shield today. Christ before you. Christ behind you. Christ beneath you. Christ above you. Christ on your right. Christ on your left. May Christ be with you. Christ be in you. Alone and in multitude. Near and far. For all you face and for all your life that you may live in the protection and the power of his blessing. Go in peace, my brothers and sisters. Amen and amen. Amen.